six dollar drink and come sit down with me in the dark of the theater. Um, but I, I'm not going to invite you to come in at the beginning of the film. Why would I do that? When there's a scene that is so compelling, but it's a ways into it. In fact, it's right in the middle of the movie. And so we'll just hang out in the lobby. And then, you know, as soon as that scene's over, I'm going to say, you know, come on, let, let, let's leave and let's go talk about that scene. Because that scene, it was in the previews. In fact, why even, why even go at all, right, to... Um, to the theater when you can just watch the previews at home, except that there's something about getting together in a big group and watching it on the big screen. Now, you might be thinking, why would I ever do that, suggest that? I want to suggest that we do that quite a bit in the life of the church. I always feel comfortable talking about church people because from the womb to this moment, I'm one of them. And so I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about me, and I may be talking about you as well. But sometimes we church folk uh, have a tendency to do just that, to invite ourselves and others uh, on our best days into an examination of something that doesn't have much of a beginning or an, or an ending, uh, but it, it, and it's so steeped in tradition and nostalgia that we just, we love it and we lift it up. Uh, and, and, we, and we nod our heads and we amen, and sometimes in the church of God even we raise one hand and we say, yes. And, and then we come back and we do that again. Um, but I, what I want to suggest is that um, that's not right. And, and that's maybe not best practice. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, and I think all of us can relate to this one probably rather immediately. So let's take Luke 15 as an example. And so the prodigal, uh, what, what we call the prodigal son or the lost son. So here you have a story that we have actually taken one story from three, I will argue in a moment, actually four narratives, and, uh, and we've taken that one story and we've zoomed to the middle and we've made it into a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, a bit of pithy theology that can be summed up like this. And we will even use the word reconciliation because here we are in SOT, right? And so we say reconciliation is when the father uh, welcomes home the prodigal son or... To, uh, to put it maybe more um, the, the way the story is told, reconciliation happens when the son comes home. So the reconciliation is between the, the son who went away and the father who longed for him to come home and waited on the porch and ran to greet him. A, an excellent part of the story. In fact, I would argue it's that scene, it's that, it's that penultimate moment in the story where it's like, if you're going to see anything, you, you, you need to watch this. And yet it's incomplete. Because all we have to do is think for a moment, like, wait a minute, we know the story has a beginning and we relish in telling that. Now, what we often forget is that the story doesn't stop there. It actually has an end. One might argue that the story is less about, and I know I'm on shaky ground here, but is less about the focus of the reconciliation between the father and the lost son and more about the reconciliation between the brothers. But we have to go further. Because even if we keep that story intact, that story follows the story of lost coin. And that follows the story of a lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 to go looking for that one. And the lady leaves the, the nine in order to desperately, frantically search for the lost coin. But we have to go a step further. And we have to step back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15 and ask, who was there? Who was the audience? Well, it was a mixed bunch. What we had, of course, in verse 1 were the sinners and tax collectors who were coming near to hear him, to hear Jesus. But just behind them, if you will, maybe a bit higher, were the scribes and the Pharisees who grumbled that he would associate with such folks. Maybe we are... Um, maybe we're... Uh, depriving ourselves of the essence of Luke 15 by focusing, by summarizing, by narrowing to the one moment that we think that, uh, that the folks will resonate with. And, and that, that one's the easiest one to promote and to get out there when really, probably, what Jesus was really getting at, in addition to the Father loves you so much, he's going to throw a party when you come home, is um, the Father's throwing a party. Don't you care? Don't you want to join in? Jonah, are you really going to content yourself sitting out here, pouting, moping, wishing to die, when God is actually on the other side of the walls of Nineveh throwing a party? Don't you see the balloons, Jonah? No, you can't because you're just lamenting your discomfort. So I, I think we, we, we do that. And so I, I want to invite us to consider a text. And I actually, uh, Dr. Lozano, I, I set you up for this. And so um, I had you read the text that we read out of context. 
or maybe not out of context so much as without its original context. And, and so, uh, but, but we're on good ground because if you open up a lectionary, in fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a lectionary that includes the story, the narrative. It's kind of like taking the heart out of the body and saying, look at this. It's like that scene in that Indiana Jones movie, right? It's like, look at this. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it compelling? In fact, you don't want to look away. It's a heart. And, and most of us, I think, at some point would say, yes, it's beautiful or it's compelling or it's disturbing or whatever it is. And, and there it is. And you've isolated it and you're showing me and I can't help but stare at it. Um, but wouldn't it be better served uh, giving life to the body? Hello. All right. And so I want to go back over here. I'm not sure what's appropriate when they're dueling pulpits and I stand down there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back over here. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to read what comes before what Dr. Lozano read to us. Now, Paul says, now in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together. Now, pay attention to those words because Paul will use them four times. When you come together. Uh, when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Uh, I think literally translated in the Greek, it's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but yeah. Uh, indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. Uh, when you come together, I, I guess five times, there, there's another one, uh, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and, and another becomes drunk. Uh, I like this. Just, what? You know, do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this manner, I do not commend you. Uh, and, and then we have, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. And so we'll get to that in just a moment. And then there's more to follow. Um, it, it's, I think it's important to note that in, in the first century, uh, there, there were not, and we know this, there were not chapels like this with nice stained glass windows. And there were not church buildings per se. We, we had houses and we had houses, you know, I think most often owned by the wealthy, the patrons, who could afford such a thing as a kitchen table, a dining room table. And maybe eight or nine folks would, would fit around those. And in the larger houses, uh, maybe 30 or 40 others could gather in the atrium. But according to the, the social mores and the customs of, of the Roman culture in which Corinth was located, it was expected of uh, patrons to have their closest friends, uh, or maybe we should say those who were in the same social status and standing as them economically and culturally and otherwise, uh, to sit around the table and, and to have the best of the best, the, the best conversation, the best food, the best drink. And, uh, and then, of course, there will be others. Uh, there, there will be freed men and women. There will be slaves and, and, and maybe some others who are, um, well, yeah, they can be out they can be out there, of course, they're under the roof, and of course we have some leftovers, and, uh, and we will heat them up in our microwave, and we will send them out there. And so Paul uh, does something, I think, rather interesting, and uh, you know, maybe a bit controversial. Um, Paul takes what we have assumed is just a liturgical expression that, that, we, that we kind of put in the middle of, of the calm waters as, as, as a reminder, as we should, of the death and resurrection of Christ, and he's actually inserted it right into the heart of the problem, right into the midst of the conflict and the issue. Uh, if, if I were to uh, summarize, I've gone back and forth on, like, if I could give you a message title. I don't often title my messages. I like to see where they go, and then, like, like maybe we'll call it that. And so, um, I, I, but I've, I've gone back and forth. And part of me wants to call this message, uh, th that's ridiculous. And so, like, if anybody, you know, asks you later, what did Todd preach about? You just say, I don't know. He's, he just thought a few things were ridiculous in the practice of church people, and he said he was one of them. And so, um, so that would be one title, um, and, and maybe a, a different way, in my hope being, of course, that we leave here, and if we bump into something that we think just doesn't line up with the model and the example of Jesus, that we might actually be bold enough like Paul and brave enough like him to say, you know, that's ridiculous. We've got to do something about that. Because, you know, and, and I forgot the other title. I, I might remember it in a minute. But... Um, We'll go with that's ridiculous, um, because it is. And I think that's what Paul was calling out. And so what has become for us a, a liturgical practice, I think was just a matter of practice for them. I think the liturgy was found at the table. Oh, here was my other title. Um, reconciliation happens when it's all on the table. Right, I like that one better too. Let's take a vote. For, no. Reconciliation happens when it's all on the table, pun intended. 
right? When it's all on the table, when the, when the bread that is to be broken and the cup that is to be poured out, when that's the focus, when really what we're talking about and focusing on is the broken and poured out life of Jesus, when it's all on the table, that's where reconciliation happens. But there's a double entendre there because in, uh, in the English language, when we say, hey, man, just make sure it's all on the table. Well, what we're talking about is no ace up the sleeve, right? No, uh, no little extra hidden back here. Nothing, nothing that, I'm, that I really probably should put out there because I think what we're dealing with there is it was, a, it was socially acceptable in their day to have different strata and different divisions. It was socially acceptable. It was the norm. But as we know, the kingdom of God sets a different standard. There's a different norm. There's a different set of expectations. And when the Corinthians were gathering, and again, quite literally, gobbling up their own food, that's a loose translation. That's the Todd translation. But it isn't just, I think it's stronger than, as I've studied it, it's more than just you didn't, you didn't wait on the others. No, you actually consumed what you brought. In other words, you ate the best. You actually got drunk in the process of gorging yourself, drinking yourself to the point of being drunk, and, and then maybe later others will show up and they can, they can graze. You know, <laughs> There was a division there. And, and, and I think what Paul was saying was that that's hypocritical. Like, how in the world can you gather around the table? Again, another, another custom of the day would have been, you know, at the Lord's Supper, as you gather around the table, there seems to be strong evidence that this practice happened not as, as we do it. And there's nothing wrong with what we do it as long as we keep it melded together with what happens outside of these doors and what happens as the community gathers in other places, like around dinner tables, like we're going to do. And I love the fact that communion happens to be lined up today with a meal out there because we might raise some stuff in here that we need to deal with out there and beyond. I think that's what Paul was getting at was that the, the liturgy happens around the common table. When we separate it, when we vacuum seal it, when we try to somehow uh, put it over here and then either stuff, uh, again, it, 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 when it's not on the table, it's like, well, I've, I'll deal with that later or I, I won't deal with that at all, but I want to put on a smiley face. How you doing? I'm good. Let's break bread together. Like, there's probably some issues there. But it's deep-rooted. Like you, I, uh, like maybe many of you, I certainly grew up, and I've lived in three or four different states now, and I, I've been in uh, Church of God most of my life, but some other traditions made a lot of observations, and I've been on both sides of the fence in terms of leadership and, um, and, and just kind of learning and growing all along the way. But here has um, almost exclusively been my understanding of what communion it has, you know, or the Lord's Supper is, this, this is how it's taught that it is a time of deep introspection. That it is that moment where I stand in line or I wait in my pew or I sit in my seat waiting for my sometimes very vacuum sealed wafer and little thimble of grape juice to come my way so that I can do some personal reconciliation with God. Let go to its furthest extreme, what that does, it creates a crippling effect where I realize deep down, and you, and you know kind of intuitively, that God is holy and other, and that is good theology, but at the same time, we know that we are not other, that we are, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and, and that again is good theology. Right? From Isaiah, right? That's, that's really good. That's Old Testament, right? So it could be argued that, okay, um, that's good theology. But what happens is I can so privatize my good theology that I'm no good to the community. And in fact, I can use a text like 1 Corinthians 11 to justify what I'm doing. I can point to the lectionary and go, look, everybody's doing it, so therefore we ought to do it. It's centuries old, it's tradition deep, and so therefore, if I want to take that text and just reflect personally on the death and resurrection of Jesus until he comes, and meanwhile, uh, create this kind of divide that says, oh, I'm not good enough, so let me try to think, can I confess one more sin? Lord, is there anything that's hidden? And you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been there. And you didn't want to take communion. You didn't feel you were worthy. You see, well, that text is, that, that's, it, that's, in the, that's in the text. You know, we need to discern the body. Friends, I want to, I want to make the contention, and, and I'm, I'm not alone um, in, in this. In fact, I, I did my dissertation in this area, and some of you were readers on that and encouraged me to dig deeper and to go further. And so I thought, hey, if I'm going to preach here, it may be the last time they ever let me do it. So I might as well just kind of get it all out on the table, because that's where reconciliation happens. Some of you ask me, are you ever going to use this stuff? Well, here it is. 